Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I bring a friend and real estate entrepreneur who is aiming to be the next Blackstone, which got me thinking about Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Tax Code. So, what is Section 1031? Why is it important, and why should an entrepreneur care? Section 1031 is a provision in the Internal Revenue Code, the IRC, that allows a business or the owners of an investment property to defer federal taxes on some exchanges of real estate. In the simplest terms, this tax advantage allows sellers to delay paying taxes on a sold piece of real estate and use the capital gains, the money earned from selling the property, for more expensive real estate. Here is an example. We buy a piece of real estate for $100,000 and then we sell it for $400,000. That is a capital gain of $300,000. Now, our gains would be subject to taxes if we took the profits. However, with Section 1031 exchange, we may be able to use that $300,000 in profit from our sold real estate to purchase one or more new properties and pay no capital gain taxes at the time of sale. The game is to trade up. Real estate is one investment vehicle that has a great tax advantage so long as individuals keep trading up in value. It is important to know gains will be taxed at the point of liquidation, the conversion of assets into cash, also known as selling an asset. Now, there are some qualifications to a 1031 exchange, and I will be the first to admit I am no expert. The tax code uses a very vague term, like kind, meaning the property that is being exchanged must be similar enough to qualify as a like kind property. What is like kind property? Well, according to the old trusty internet, like kind property is property of the same nature, character, or class. Quality or grade does not matter. Most real estate will be like kind to other real estate. For example, real property that is improved with a residential rental house is like kind to vacant land. One exception for real estate is that property within the United States is not like kind to property outside the United States. Also, improvements that are not conveyed without land are not like kind to land. Did I confuse everyone? Perfect. I was too. Again, I am no expert and I am learning as we go along this journey together. I read a quote from a tax expert, Robert Wood, that helped explain it a little bit more clearly. Most exchanges must merely be like kind in an enigmatic phrase. That doesn't mean what you think it means. You can exchange an apartment building for raw land or a ranch for a strip mall. The rules are surprisingly liberal. You can even exchange one business for another. But again, there are traps for the unwary. Other restrictions include you must own real estate, owning a share of a REIT, which we discussed briefly in this episode, a fund or an LLC that owns a share of another LLC does not qualify. You can only perform a 1031 exchange between investment properties. You can't do this with personal properties like your place of residence. Exchange for cheaper property equals taxes. You can delay your exchange, which most people do, where the third party acts as uh, in between, between you and a prospective future buyer. 45 days and 100 days are important to remember. As I stated, I'm still learning and this is something quite new to me. However, I see the benefits in Section 1031 exchange to all entrepreneurs looking to create additional sources of revenue. In the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is discussed in this episode, Section 1031 is discussed if you are interested in learning a little bit more. I'm sure there are other books out there. That just happens to be one that I read and it is discussed in this episode. As entrepreneurs, understanding the tax code can have huge advantages in maintaining a larger asset column than liabilities. But don't take my word for it. Get out there, look at some tax codes, and talk to a tax accountant and do some reading. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. 
So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have the co-founder and chief investment officer of Peak Asset Management, Bob Thomas. What's going on, buddy? Nothing. Thanks for having me. It's uh, quite a day out there. It, it's raining. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. I had an episode that we were talking about the heat in Oregon and we're completely 180 and it is pouring down rain. The, the season has shifted. <laughs> it's <official. laughs> it's shifted. So, Bob, thank you so much for coming on the show. First, let's introduce the world. Who is who is Bob? Um, I am a real estate entrepreneur uh, based in Portland, Oregon. Um, my company, Peak Asset Management, we own and operate commercial real estate uh, throughout the metro of Portland and uh, the greater West Coast. And we're looking to expand nationally over the next year to two years. Nice. Where, where are you trying to expand to? Um, we like some markets in the southeast um, and on the eastern seaboard. So we like Atlanta, um, Charlotte Metro, Raleigh Durham. Uh, get into more specifics, but just looking to kind of expand to where we see some economic fundamentals that support potential investments. How do you how do you go through that process of like determining what is the economic benefits of going through these markets? I think we start with kind of major major like major economic factors uh supply constraint from a you know kind of supply side uh, perspective as well as population growth uh median income you know just kind of like larger larger metrics so when you're buying something you're saying there's not going to be a ton more of what i'm buying coming online to dilute the supply um and then you know the demand is increasing relative to who's who the user base is nice nice now let's before we get too deep into what <laughs> what what is what does your business do? Let's let's kind of talk about yeah. what Peak Asset Management is. Definitely. So we are a vertically integrated real estate investment company. Um, so we raise money from high net worth individuals uh, and invest it on their behalf in um, usually value add type real estate investments. Um, we are also integrated. So uh, we're real estate. Bro- we are real estate brokers. We have a property management company. Um, so effectively we're like the quarterback of a real estate deal Mm -hmm. where we acquire and find the deal. We raise the money for it and operate it, um, cradle to grave. Nice. And are those now, are those similar to like, what do they call like the reeks or right? Oh man. REITs, real estate investment trust. There's a lot of different potential ownership structures of, um, of real estate. This is not a REIT. REITs are very uh, specific in terms of how they're capitalized, how money gets dispersed back to the owners. Uh, we are typically doing things um, mostly in syndications right now and some gen- uh, some joint ventures, but uh, it's basically, uh, we do a lot of regulation D, kind of unregistered securities. You have to raise them from uh, accredited investors who are like high net worth individuals. Um, and, and yeah, so there's some specifics in terms of who can invest in the deals, um, but mostly they're just individual partnerships or LLCs um, with various limited partners who are investing. Gotcha. So where did the concept come from? How did, how did this all occur? How did, how the company start? Well, so my background um, is probably a good place to start with. Yeah. Uh, So I went to school for accounting down in San Diego, got a couple degrees in accounting, um, but I'd really wanted to do real estate. Like I'd been interested in real estate since I was like eight. I think I saw a bunch of everyone who I saw who was extremely wealthy or well off they all had one thing in common and it was a bunch of property ownership. Um, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm making this connection. I think I need to do that. So I, I did a lot of internships in college and I was always trying to get into the, just kind of dip my toe into different facets of real estate. Um, but when it came to picking a major in college, the question was, well, do you do real estate right away or do you get more of a, you know, kind of business oriented educational base that you can then leverage um, with some cajoling from, 
other people in my life who were helping <laughs> <laughs> who were helping finance the, the college education. Um, I, I ended up going the, the accounting route, um, which was great. Uh, out of, I got a couple degrees in accounting out of school, went to work for a big public accounting firm, uh, audited large public companies, um, a lot of tech mergers and acquisitions. So really got to understand, uh, you know, kind of like just the baseline of business from a very high level um, public capital markets, like all that, all that fun stuff. Uh, after three or four years there, I realized that I did not want to go on to become a partner uh, in a public accounting firm. They don't, they make a lot of money, but they never have time to spend it. Mm. So uh, I, I, at that point was up in San Francisco um, and I got a job with CBRE who are, you know, one of the larger yep. commercial brokerage houses in the, in the world. Um, worked on their institutional capital markets group. So we were selling large office buildings for, institutional clients, um, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, you know, people who own the office towers in downtown San Francisco. Um, so we, we were, you know, basically helping people buy and sell those kinds or helping funds buy and sell those kinds of deals. That's where I really got a, an understanding of how large commercial real estate deals are put together, how, how they're valued, et cetera. Um, after I'd seen enough of that, I said, well, instead of being a broker, how about we you know, become the principal and do it on that side of things. So uh, there's a story behind that, but that's kind of how, you know, I kind of saw the light and I said, (laughs) you know, you can make a percentage on commissions selling these deals, but you're really leaving, you know, someone else to to clean up um, and and make, and make the real money. So that was kind of where that. That is very true. Now. So how did you guys formulate the business? What, what did you guys decide to do with like LLC, S Corp, C Corp? So I I think what you see, and, and there's a lot of different, underlying businesses. I think I've probably got 40 or 50 LLCs with the state of Oregon and around the country right now. Um, most asset management kind of platforms, I mean, you can see it from, if, if you were to, if you were to take my company <clears throat> to scale, which we're trying to do, um, you would kind of look at it like a Brookfield or a um, Blackstone or a KKR, at least on the real estate front. Right. So those are kind of the large companies. And what you've seen is before 10 or 15 years ago, they were all partnerships with a bunch of sub entities. And it was just, you know, like every deal was kind of capitalized individually that rolled up to this parent company. Um, Over the past 10 years, they've all gone public and they've seen their stock prices go nuts. Um, But so we're kind of in that partnership kind of phase where each deal is kind of individually capitalized. The partners get their share, the general partner, you know, gets their promoted interest. Um, And so, so right now, Peak is a LLC um, owned by my, my portion is owned by my S Corp for tax reasons. Um, and then I own my, all of my investments through a separate LLC. That's just a disregarded single member LLC. I could also, I'm, I'm a former CPA, so I could get into why that's smart. <laughs> why that's done. Like yeah. That. We'll, we'll talk about that after the show. Yeah. We don't, we're not trying to give away the, the farm over here now. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about the funding of the business because mm-hmm. you know, this is, this is, this is really good stuff. Let's, let's talk about, did you, especially real estate, it's kind of difficult because real estate kind of is, as you mentioned, you're working with high capital individuals. Mm-hmm. Those aren't just laying around, right? <laughs> how, how, how do you build this business? And then one, first, how did you get the capital to build the business? And then how did you build it? Because you, you mentioned you're scaling. So how did you kind of get from point A to point B from the finance perspective? Bootstrap, yeah, at, yeah, yeah. At, at least along the individual side of things. Perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, I am... Looking back on it, you know, I, I probably should have raised more capital up front and given away some of the company. It would have accelerated our timeline by a few years. I would also not be as equity heavy in the, as the business. So, you know, there's, there's trade-offs there. Um, we're integrated, right? So I, I think the big thing for our business is the property management company is kind of the, the base revenue generation where mm-hmm. if everything else goes to shit, you've still got this property management company that, you know, downturn or not, people are, unless there's COVID, going to be paying rent, you're going to be getting fees. And so that should, you know, theoretically sustain the business. So it's been, how do we bootstrap the property management company to scale, to support um, the overhead for the, you know, acquisitions and other parts of the business? Um, Now that we've gotten there, I look back and I say, shit, I should have just bought a property management company. (laughs) (laughs) Made it a little easier. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, nonetheless, we're here now and, and, you know, we're at that scale point where we're really starting to look at um, hiring 
high level asset management acquisitions folks to really kind of accelerate the growth of the of the business that will you know end up feeding the property management company and kind of create this virtuous cycle. Nice. And you know one of the things you mentioned is, you know, you have roughly 40 50 LLCs, right? Yeah. What was your first business? Oh man. Um well, so I created, I, man, I so I, I'm, a, I'm a real estate broker. Um, and so I created an entity to funnel the revenues from that real estate brokerage, uh, you, you know, through to me. So that was one of the first businesses I created. One of the first more entrepreneurial kind of real estate investment ventures. I think my fr- uh, it was a partnership between a capital partner, uh, myself and my contractor friend. And we went and flipped a house in the, Southwest Hills or the Northwest Hills of, uh, of Portland. Mm, nice. Nice. You know, wh- what would you say has been difficult about this whole process, the entrepreneurial versus just real estate or all of it, I'd say, you know, I, I, I really enjoy, um, like the challenges that come along with it. I think that, um, I think it's frustrating not being able to grow more quickly. You know, I mean, we have goals, you know, like I, like people kind of laugh when I say this, but like I have a 10 year target of, of like with Blackstone in my sites. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, they're the biggest owner of real estate in the world right now. They've got like 120 billion of, of assets under management on the real estate side. And our goal is to hit 120 billion inflation adjusted in the next 10 years. Um, and so, you know, when, when it's like, all right, how do we scale that more quickly? Yeah. Right? Cause every, you know, I mean, you need to be on a serious J curve exponential growth to hit that kind of target. And so every month that we're, you know, not putting new deals in the pipeline to close, et cetera, you know, we're, it, it's harder to make that target. Um, so the, the biggest thing for me is just like, how do I push momentum and, and not myself get in the way of that momentum? Um, and it, it, in my mindset shift over the past year or so, where we're not a deal by deal company anymore. Like we are a real estate company that buys, operates real estate. And so thinking of it more like I'm building a company that does deals instead of I do real estate deals. Right. Um, that might not seem like a, like a total mind, mindset shift, but it was, it was huge. Um, and so now we're just working on basically building a company that, that does what I used to kind of think of was the end goal. And I would imagine, you know, pivoting like that also pivots your marketing scheme. Right. Did you, how, how do you market your business to, to your clients? So I think there's two pieces, right. Of, of that. There's the acquisition side, um, where you're, you know, marketing to the, the sources of deals out there, whether right. it's off market deals, brokers, et cetera. Um, and then there's more of the, the capital raising side of things. Um, both so far have been very referral driven, um, and, you know, I, I think my, I, I wear a lot of hats in the real estate industry in and around town. And so just my network has been able to source the deals. And then on the um, <clears throat> investor side, it's, it's been more like referral based. So, you know, you start out, but, but from, from investors. So you just start out, you can get maybe two, two, three people in a deal that finally pays off. And then all of a sudden these guys are like, oh, what do you, you know, they're talking to their buddies. What, what are you doing for investments? I've got this guy up in Portland who, you know, keeps hitting, keeps knocking out of the park on these deals. And then you just start getting referrals that way. So, um, you know, starts out kind of friends and family on one side of things and then, and then just starts to balloon from there. Um, where I see it going though, is definitely more, uh, you know, kind of corporate based where like we have a capital group that's going out and, and really just working relationships with high net worth investors. We've got an acquisitions person who, you know, has a background in brokerage, um, who's really just, you know, every day pounding the pavement for deals uh, up until now myself and a few partners have been doing all that work Yeah, and it's scalable to a point, but the real way to scale it is for, to remove myself from that process. Yeah. What was, what would you say has been kind of difficult of the, about scaling this business currently? Um, it's, you need to prove that you're able to, you need to prove to, to lenders, you need to prove to equity partners, and you need to prove to the sellers of these deals that you kind of have the, the capacity and the experience to do it. And so it's that, you know, it, it's kind of like how when I first wanted to break into real estate, they were like, oh, do you have any real estate experience? 
was like, no, I really want to have real estate experience, but like, no, I don't. But if I, if I don't have experience, how am I going to get experience? You know? Right. And so it's this, it's this vicious cycle you can't break into. It's the same kind of thing when you're starting to scale, right? Like we're in contract on a 30 unit, um, multifamily property that we're closing next month in Southeast Portland. Um, if, if I went and tried to buy a 200 unit deal, you know, these guys would be like, well, what other 200 unit deals do you own? I'd be like, well, I'm, I'm sorry. So it just takes a little bit to build up to that point in terms of, you know, now we've got 200 doors under, under, you know, ownership. So now it's like, okay, well, look, we have it here. It's kind of aggregated, but we've got the capital and we've got the experience. So, so let us go do it. So that, that's the really hard part about scaling this is it just takes time to build the experience and build a cachet to where all the players, as you start leveling up in this industry, take you seriously. What have, has there been any easy parts of this process? So I, I think I, I come from a, like, what's nice is with my background of kind of having done this at some of the higher levels of, of real estate, I, I see how I've seen how it works. And so, you know, I come in with a lot of, um, with a lot of institutional level knowledge, uh, that in the, in the areas of the business I've been playing in, which has been more mid market up till now, you know, buy an eight plex, buy a 20 plex, something like that. A lot of those owners and brokers and everything else don't have the same like institutional level knowledge and, and ways to creative ways to structure things. And so I'm able to kind of lean on that a little bit where, you know, someone might only be looking at a deal in one way, either on an, how do you, you know, value add the property to an exit or how do you capitalize this? Or, you know, is there, you know, some form of creative debt involved? Um, I'm able to kind of layer all that on and I can usually create a better solution that, that drives more value and I can either there, then therefore pay more for it or in some way able to execute the deal better than someone else that who's playing in that same level. So let's say, let's just, let's give a, let's give the folks at home an example. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a client. Let's say I'm a prospective client and I I'm coming with hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I want to invest. Take me through that process that you would take a client. Yeah. So I, I think the first thing w- when I meet with, you know, prospective investor um, is, is trying to understand what their investment goals are because mm. everyone's yeah. investment goals are different. Very true. And I could have a killer deal that I think is just amazing. But you know, if, if this deal that I have is I'm going to build 30 units of ground up multifamily in Portland and you are, you know, very risk averse near retirement looking for cash flow like those two don't align, right? There's right. a ton of risk in development. It could all go sideways. You're not going to see cash flow for at least two years. Um, and, and so, so you want to make sure that the investments align. Now, like we have three main kinds of investments that, that we focus on. One is more of that, like kind of day one cash flow. It's a little bit lower yield, uh, but it's, it's safer. Um, and, and we usually are able to buy the properties well enough where Know, the, the deals make sense in a fairly low risk. Almost like a turnkey kind of home. Almost like, no, yeah, yeah kind of. It, it's like, I'm never going to, until I get way cheaper capital, I'm just never going to buy something that's like turnkey. But, you know, I'll, I'll buy like the, that, that property I just mentioned in, in um, downtown Portland, like, or sorry, uh, Southeast Portland. Within 90 days of owning that thing, we're going to be hitting 10% like levered cash returns. So 10, like you put in a hundred grand, you sh- there should be like like 10k a year in in income that's coming back off that thing just after 90 days of doing a few little rent roll changes super low risk right. um you know cash flows day one the, the the second and so that would be more like kind of our value add cash flow play the second one is um like opportunistic stuff so we're building apartments around town mm-hmm. um not a ton of cash flow day one way more risk you're also looking at like significantly higher returns right so you know wait two years and maybe you get like you put in your hundred, maybe you get like 140 or 160 back or, or, you know, something more like that. Um, and then there's a third piece that, that we've done a few deals of, and I'm looking to do more of, um, where it's, it's more like a tax efficient strategy. So like we bought a, a car wash, uh, recently and a mobile home park. And, and those are like, there's, there's some, some tax gimmicks in, in those kinds of assets that, that make them, um, make them really attractive from a year one depreciation standpoint. So like we bought a gas station, sorry, a car wash for I think 800 grand and we got 600 grand of loss year one on it. <laughs> and, 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 and as real estate professionals, we can use that to offset our other active income. Yeah. So if you think about that at like a, you know, call it 50 or 40% tax rate, 
like the IRS gave us about 300 K yeah. to buy this place. And we only put in like 200 K in cash. So like, you're just walking into a good deal because like, you know, the IRS is basically paying you to buy it. Yeah. So value add cash flow, kind of more opportunistic development and then like tax efficient investing are kind of our main three avenues that, that, that we looked at when, when someone comes in. So I'd try to place you, you know, if you say, Hey, I got a hundred K I try to place you in one of those buckets. Yeah. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. Um, and then we'd go and, and try to put you into the, the right deal for you. And you know, one of the things you highlighted is the, the, the different tax gimmicks and schemes that are available to individuals such as myself and, and individuals out there that are listening to this show, take advantage of those try to lower your put as much as you possibly can in your retirement, in your IRA, you know, always, I think it's this year's 19,500 max that out. We're going to talk after the show about this LLC stuff a little bit more, <laughs> but, but first, you know, let's, let's kind of, let's go back a little bit. Think about all these things that you've kind of been through now. What advice would you would have loved to have had before you got into this business? So like you're, well, first of all, right, like I, I think that you're, you are the sum of your experiences. And so, yeah. you know, I, I don't really live with regrets. And, you know, I think that, you know, with all the, I mean, I've, I've failed quite a few times in different things I've done, but I've learned from those. And so I wouldn't be who I am today without having done that. Um, I, I do wish that I had started actually acquiring real estate at, at an earlier age. Um, I think the first, uh, I think I bought my first piece of property maybe five years ago, maybe five or six years ago. Um, and I should have done that when I was in my early twenties. Um, I could have done it. I just didn't know how to buy real estate. So if mm-hmm. I had to go back and tell myself, I, I would give myself a very brief overview of like, look, there are a few different ways where you don't really need cash. Just go and buy a property because that kind of changes your mindset to thinking how easy, the, how easy it is to get into, you know, kind of continuing, continuing to portfolio properties. Um, so I feel like, you know, I'm like, I'm like 32. I'm not like super, I, I, I feel like I'm still in my, you know, prime and able to do this well, but I, I could be 10 years ahead if, if I had started 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, what's kind of frustrating. I must admit about the, the housing market sometimes is it is a little difficult to get the loan versus a student loan. You know, I always talk about this often of, you know, I started this podcast cause I went to Syracuse and I was reading all these, you know, case studies with all these entrepreneurs. And I'm like, why am I paying all this money when I can just interview these entrepreneurs for free and, and have them discuss it? Federal government was willing to give me that student loan pretty quickly with a 6% <laughs> interest, but trying to get a home loan for with a 3% interest is a lot harder these days. It seems like with that said, what advice would you give younger, you know, either real estate investors or future prospective um, investors? What, what advice would you have for them? Uh, similar to, you know, what I wish I had known when I was younger is, is, you know, there's other ways to buy properties and get into real estate deals than taking, you know, than working your ass off for five years to get a 20% down payment to go and, you know, put some money down or even, you know, putting your 5% down and paying PMI. Like there are creative ways to find off market properties, to work with sellers, to have sellers lend you the money. Like there, there's a lot of, other ways besides what people think is, is the only way to buy real estate to do it. Um, and so, you know, wh- whether you go out and network at investing groups or, you, you know, basically just expand, fig- you know, go um, to education, you know, seminars, like in some way invest in yourself, either time or money for education or just networking to find people who are doing it and just figure out how to add value to them and just be a sponge and learn from them. And the more quickly you can go and start doing that, the more quickly you can, you know, leverage that, that knowledge gained in order to you know, benefit yourself. You know, one of the things you talked about is one, a lot of this business has been referral based, mm-hmm. right? Two, you kind of talked about the friends and family, you know, there's the one who really started it. And now you're kind of talking about network. How important is networking in your industry? It's everything. I mean, like it, it is literally everything. And if you, if you, like if you're, you could tarnish your reputation very quickly. And so, you know, being, being able to one deliver on, on what you, what you say you can consistently, um, and then to kind of be, a, a resource for, you know, everyone else. I, I think that helps like when, if, if you can kind of be that, that choke point in the funnel and you can know everyone 
and you can know what everyone needs and then just kind of be that connector, all of a sudden you become the go-to person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so, and the, the more knowledge you have, right around for me, it's around like the, the financing side. Like if you know how some, Oh, well you should partner with this guy. He'll give you the equity for the deal. And here's where you can get the debt from. And Oh, then, then you have the person, well, I've got a guy who needs the equity here. You know, I'll put you two together. All of a sudden you start to become that, that, you know, center point in the hub. Yeah. Um, if you consistently do that and perform, uh, you just start to get a lot of inbound traffic. Um, and, and you start to see a lot of opportunities or the f- get first looks at opportunities that other people don't. So answer your question, network in my industry is absolutely everything. Nice. So for the folks that want to network with you, they want to get a hold of Bob Thomas, want to hear more about peak asset and management, maybe possible investors out here listening. How do they do that? Um, so I, I am a total real estate junkie. <laughs> I, I love talking deals and I love just kind of chatting through investment, you know, investment ideas and, and options and, and trying to fit people in the right, you know, the right place. So I'm um, always happy to chat with people. Um, my number is 503-489-7658. Giving out the phone number. I or, like that. Or uh, bthomas at peakassetmgt.com. Either of those ways, perfect to reach me. Um, I am always open to chat. Like, you know, if, if someone's looking at buying a house and, and just like want to kind of talk through different options, like I, I'll, I'll take 15 minutes and chat with you about it. If you're looking at like, you know, buying your first office building, you know, and, and trying to figure it out, like I'll, I'll help you chat with it. If you just have never done real estate before and, and are curious as to what real estate's about, like let's talk. Yeah. And I, I got to admit, this is very true. In fact, you know, completely unrelated to this, but how you and I met was we were just randomly at the food carts there in Beaverton, in Beaverton, Oregon. And we just started chatting. Mm-hmm. And then it became, oh, you're into real estate. And you actually knew one of my former guests, Bob Boxler, who mm-hmm. I went to school with. And then and then we're like, hey, let's, next thing you know, we're chatting, we're having drinks, and now we're on the podcast. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 it is, it's all about meeting people and staying open to seeing where relationships can go. Yep, it's uh, very true. Yeah. Bob. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.